We're going to talk about the five pillars of fat loss, ranging from nutrition to exercise. I'm here with Alan Aragon, Love who it, is buddy. my man. Uh, hey, take a couple seconds, just introduce yourself, and then we'll kind of get into the meat and potatoes of this. So I am a professional footnote at the end of uh, people's college term papers. That's, that's essentially what I am. So my colleagues and I, we do the science that uh, forms the practice guidelines for coaches, for personal trainers, for dietitians, and uh, yeah, a lot of sitting at the computer, a lot of sitting at PubMed. <laughs> so you're like almost a literal translator of, of research. I mean, really, in a lot of ways. You mm -hmm. surmise it, you put it in somewhat layman's terms, and you oversee a lot of it. Yep, yep, so. a lot of it. We, we just, as a community of researchers, we peer review each other's work, we report on it, and on occasion we put together trials ourselves and you know, we investigate different questions and stuff. So on my end, a lot of the primary research with my colleagues and I was on the post-exercise anabolic window, immediate post-exercise versus immediate pre-exercise, and, and then just doing meta-analytic summations of the existing body of work in this area where you take all of the studies, all of the relevant studies, and you try to make sense of uh, what we think we know. Nice. And then you do that, you publish that in narrative reviews, in uh, systematic reviews, and in um, just editorials. So, and try to put it out there to the research community as well as the public. And so we just try to figure out wh what do we actually know here, you know, and, yeah. and how much of this can we take and make it useful for the general public. That's yeah. the tough part. That's the really tough part because it's, you know, we're in an era where information is everywhere. People can go out and information, but being able to put it in a way that's pragmatic and practical and can this actually be used? And I remember, you know, back in the day reading your stuff back on bodybuilding.com forums way back when. And I think, you know, who doesn't like a little bit of drama? I think we should kind of start with uh, <laughs> how we actually met, um, you know, five years ago or so when yeah. our, uh, <laughs> well, I'll let you tell the story. Gosh, is it only five years ago? Oh, man, it seems a lot longer than that. It might have um, been more like seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. So, uh, I heard about you, if I may in incriminate my friend Lane Norton, I heard about you through Lane ranting about like something you posted. Yeah. And I think that I don't even remember whether it was on Facebook or whether it was on Instagram. It was just kind of back in a slightly different era. And so I'm like, what? What do you say? Let me at him. Let me, let me go get him. So I, I was already mad at you by the time I like <laughs> arrived at your doorstep. and, and, and um, I, I just made a post criticizing your post and then you came into the comment section, which is rare to begin with, right? Like a, a lot of people, if they, they see somebody like doing something in opposition or just coming at them online, they either just, just avoid it completely or they come in there and just start throwing it right back. And so you came in there really respectfully and you, you said this comment, I don't remember exactly what you said, but it made me go, oh damn, this is a respectful and open-minded human being. I, I, I freaking came at him all wrong. You know, this isn't the way that we move the field forward. And I gave it some more thought and I honestly, I, I took down my post. <laughs> and I rarely do that. Yeah. I re even, yeah, so that, that's kind of how we met. It's it's cool, and the reason I was kind of wanted to start with that is like we we met through being on sort of opposite ends of the spectrum, and out of sort of this constant fight that's happening in the world of nutrition. I'm right, you're wrong, blah blah blah. blah. Um, and reality is, it's you know we're all trying to move everything forward the same way. But let's kick off kind of the fun part of this video. I wanted to say, okay, you mentioned something earlier about you know how many carbohydrates you think I eat in a day, and yeah. as, so we'll have some fun and then we'll get into the five pillars. So, okay, if you had to look at me, how many grams of carbohydrates would you say that I typically have in a given day or a week? Okay, so I had some prior knowledge that you were the keto guy. Mm -hmm. But I look at the amount of muscle mass that you carry and I just look at the, you know, the fullness of the muscles and I'm like, he's not under 100 grams of carbs. I, I would guess like he's lowballing it at like 120. And I would not be surprised at all if he's like, like hovering around 200 even. So I, I want to say 120 to, 120 to 200. So that was my guess. Mm -hmm. And then 
Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, right now, not being strict keto right now, I'm yeah, in the ballpark of 90 ish, maybe 120 on a higher carb, on a day. Higher carb day. And then some days, some days even less, you know, mm -hmm. I try to kind of move it back and forth depending on what I'm doing. And the funny thing is, and I think people that are, are interested in the training side of things will find this interesting is I actually am generally fuller when I'm keto. And it probably has to do with just glycogen just resynthesizing through gluconeogenesis like a little bit more aggressively for me being so what's called keto adapted or fat adapted like I actually hold more glycogen in my muscles seemingly when I'm on keto then when I kind of go into this gray area of lowish carb I actually kind of deflate and then if I do if I do yeah. start having yeah. more like 200 300 mm -hmm. then I fill up a lot more you know what's super interesting about that is um and you're probably aware of this research Thomas um this was the FASTER study by Jeff Volek. Yep. Mm -hmm. And the oddest and strangest thing, and I, you know, I actually asked Jacob Wilson about what he thinks is, is going on with that. And he had his own hypotheses and stuff, but um, these elite endurance athletes who were on legit keto had the same glycogen, well, statistically non-significantly different glycogen storage as the conventional high carb, low fat group elite endurance athletes carrying the same glycogen levels and and to this day it is kind of a mystery as to uh you know how how they actually are carrying that amount of glycogen um but it also makes me not too damn surprised at what you just said because we actually have some data looking at that yeah that yeah, phenomenon it's, it's it's bizarre i mean i really do find it's like if i yeah if i go if i go all the way we talked a little bit before the cameras are rolling about sort of that low carb gray area it's like I always say this quote, so you know, forgive me for saying it again, but you know, with great power comes great responsibility. It's like, if you're gonna go low carb, for me, it's almost better just to go all the way and get the benefit of at least having some ketones so I have some glycogen sparing effect and things like that. If I'm sitting in this kind of gray area, you know, then I'm glycolytic and I only have 100 grams of carbs to spare. Yeah. Like, you know, and it's like I can bonk a lot easier. So it's, I find I either have to go all the way and increase my carbohydrates more or go all the way the other way or be okay with sitting in this sort of, I don't know, I guess it's a certain level of hermesis that's happening here because it's like I'm transitioning back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but anyhow, with that, you know, we want to kind of talk about what we would consider the five pillars of fat loss or what you would consider the five pillars of fat loss and things and practical things that people can do with what we know today. And what's interesting is, uh, you know, you were sort of the godfather of flexible dieting, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. which is funny because people that watch my channel are probably going to think, they automatically hate you because of that, <laughs> you know, and it's funny. We've talked about how like flexible dieting and, you know, being able to have flexibility with what you eat, as long as you're within a certain, uh, you know, calorie range and this and that there's more than meets the eye to it. Obviously it's not yeah. just that simple, mm -hmm. but that would make people believe that, okay, well, there's only, it's only one equation that we're looking at. We're looking at calories and that's all this guy's going to say. Nothing else matters. I think there's a much more nuanced discussion with pillars of fat loss that mm -hmm. we could talk about. Like, so starting off, just off the top of your head with no rehearsal whatsoever, what would you say like the number one pillar of fat loss is for people that are in that stage of their life? I put a link down below for Thrive Market. If you are doing any kind of eating pattern, I don't care if you are vegan, if you are paleo, if you are keto, if you are AIP, it does not matter eating in a deficit can still give you these benefits that we're talking about. So Thrive Market's an online membership-based grocery store. That link gets you 25% off your entire grocery order. That means everything you put in your shopping cart, you're gonna save 25% off that grocery order. Plus you get a free gift. And this is only if you're using my link down below in the description. Okay, I've been working with Thrive Market on this channel for five years, touting them in all kinds of videos. They're a huge sponsor. So that link down below saves you 25%. Plus the best part, you order up your groceries, you can sort by diet type, figure out what works for you, and then it gets delivered to your doorstep within two, three days. So A, you get everything that you could ever want and you can search for it and you can sort by diet type. B, you don't have to waste your time going to the grocery store, running into people you don't wanna run into. And C, it ends up at your doorstep, all packaged up, all in a really good way that you can just rock and roll, put it in your pantry, or even put their sustainable meat and seafood options directly in your freezer. Okay, so check them out down below in the description. Ooh, that's huge, man. You're, okay, so number one pillar of fat loss would be to individualize the approach. And so there are various programming elements that you can individualize. And uh, those might end up being at least a few of the pillars, right? So. Um, 
a, a, a non-negotiable pillar would be to get enough protein and maybe the other non-negotiable for fat loss would be to by the end of the week make sure you uh, impose a net caloric deficit it doesn't have to be a daily thing it can be non-linear throughout the week or it can be linear as long as that caloric deficit is imposed by the end of the week and then you string a bunch of weeks together um, so so yeah the, where individualizing the approach comes in is you have to individualize the proportion of carbohydrate and fat to what the individual prefers and can sustain and can adhere to and then another aspect of individualizing would be to individualize the food selection um, within the food groups and a, a, how much you cover each food group is, is another topic of uh, conversation and debate but you do have to individualize the food choices you can't just tell person A that all right, you have to have ribeye for your protein and you have to have asparagus for your, you know, your vegetable, you know, got to individualize that. And then maybe a, a final uh, tidbit of individualization would be to individualize the hedonic approach, the hedonic allotment or the junk food or fun food or indulgence food allotment. How are you going to manage that? How are you going to incorporate that? Is it going to be a daily thing? Is it going to be a weekly thing? And that can be individualized as well. So um, I guess pulling back, the most important uh, pillar of fat loss would be to individualize the approach. And then somewhere maybe be, you know, being another pillar would be get protein right and make sure you are netting a caloric deficit by the end of each week. Yeah. And then like there's, the, there's more I could add on. <laughs> no, I, mean, I like that you mentioned the week thing. It's something that's like a recurring mantra on my channel is mm -hmm. especially when we talk about intermittent fasting a lot. I'm like, I, we can talk about different benefits, different this and that until we're blue in the face. But at the end of the day, if you look at your calories at the end of a week, it might make people that are doing intermittent fasting's life a lot easier because, hey, you know, maybe you are only getting 1,000 calories on the day that you're doing 16-8, but maybe you're getting 3,000 calories the next day. And I also think that that's very, very important in order to not end up in this chronic caloric deficit all the time, right? Like, it's like that's a, an issue that people that are fasting run into all the time is they start doing 16-8 every day, they lose weight for a while, and then just the next thing you know, you've put yourself just right back into caloric restriction in the first place. You're just mm -hmm. not having breakfast. You know, so yeah. if you at least look at it at the end of the week, okay, I need to get 14,000 calories at the end of the week. I don't care if I get 1,000 calories on Sunday and 3,000 calories on Tuesday. I'm netting it out over the course of the week. And that includes even if you are someone that's doing longer fast, 24, 36 hour, even 48 hours. Like, if you just let that go away and not try to recoup a little bit so you're at just sort of this net sort of balance or slight deficit or slight surplus or whatever at the end of the week, yeah, I mean, that is, I don't want to say damaging, but it could be damaging or at least damaging to your goals. Sure, sure. You know, and there's a, a the way to look at a caloric deficit. Um, it really starts kind of crystallizing when people run into these weight loss or fat loss plateaus. So um, when you hit a plateau, there, there's like the obvious things that people think of doing, right? They're just cut calories back further. And then some of the less obvious stuff would be, okay, cut calories back further and or increase energy out by just adding more training volume. And then um, the third thing that is kind of an interesting approach too is, is just by, is by raising total calories at the same time that you either purposely or unintentionally raise physical activity or training output. And um, this would be raising energy flux. Which, and so that would be, you know, the third kind of um, forgotten lost art. Of, yeah, uh, instead of just progressively restrict, 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 restrict. And then the, the, maybe a fourth uh, solution to a plateau would be just to take a break from the diet. Yeah. Take a mental and, and, and physical break from the diet. So that's yeah, well, a whole which, other topic. Well, too. and there's evidence on both sides of that, from the mental side and from the physical mm -hmm. side. And, and coming back to, to that G-flux, that energy flux that we were just, you just mentioned, I've talked about that a little bit on my channel mm -hmm. in videos that have never really gone anywhere because it's such a, it's a hard topic to really grasp. But 
and, and you said something that was very, very key there that I don't know if everyone caught, but it was like whether it's unintentionally. And I think what you're probably alluding to is sometimes when you start increasing calories, you have this increase in your non-exercise activity yeah. thermogenesis. You start moving more. You start maybe you're fidgeting more. Literally, yeah. little things like that you don't even realize. Mm -hmm. You increase your calories and suddenly maybe it's light housework. Maybe it's doing this kind of thing, bouncing mm -hmm. your feet. These things that you don't take into consideration yeah. where your net energy balance is actually better off. Yeah. Um, so with that, can you give the most basic sort of layman's explanation of mm -hmm. energy flux? Because I think this is a really big thing. I've talked about it when, with people with doing diet breaks. Like, hey, mm -hmm. like guys, increase your calories and increase your output. Try that. It can potentially, to sound cheeky, rekindle your metabolism a mm -hmm. little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, energy flux. So somebody at a low energy flux would be this hypothetical person who is on bed rest and consuming enough calories to just maintain their body weight and body composition on straight ahead bed rest. That is a low energy flux person. A high energy flux person, it may be a archetypical example would be an Olympic athlete. So they're consuming double the calories of the bed rest person and they're expending double the calories of the, of the bed rest person. And so yeah, they're both at a net energy equilibrium, but one of them is generating a spectrum of physiological adaptations to be able to deal with that level of uh, dynamic energy flux. And these things would include increased bone density, increased muscle mass, and then at the kind of more micro level, an increased mitochondrial activity, and just, you know, at the neurological level, better proprioception, more functionality in terms of the whole musculoskeletal uh, integration and even you know brain work as well and so there's a whole bunch of different adaptations that person that somebody at a high energy flux has to maintain physiologically behaviorally everything uh, compared to somebody who's at a low energy flux who's just essentially sedentary and eating to maintain their body composition and it's just two different worlds with, frankly, you know, two different set of risks yeah. on both sides. Of course, of course. So, yeah. Now, I'm not an anthropologist, but, you know, I, I have tried to research as much as I can in that to understand somewhat even historic, I say this with air quotes because who knows, historically accurate ways of eating, right? Because there's such a, I'm all about eating meat. I'm all about eating animal products. I am. I'm, I'm not a carnivore, mm -hmm. but there's obviously this big ancestral eating movement that's kind of happened in the last couple of years where, which quite honestly, I mean, I, I like a lot of attributes of it. Would I say that's the way to go? Not necessarily, but mm -hmm. I'm sure I love animal products. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I bring this up is I think we forget. I had Dr. Tommy Wood. I'm not sure if you uh, know of Dr. Tommy Wood, but yeah. on my channel a while back, and we talked offline about this, how like, if you look back at our ancestors, like we today, an, ath an athletic person today or an active person today, I think he said it was something like, is probably five to six times more active than an active person back then from what we know. Mm -hmm. And the reason he said that is to sort of cast a little bit of, give a little bit of amnesty towards, hey, like the carbohydrates and stuff for an active person today, we can't be having the same discussion about, well, our ancestors never ate these carbohydrates because our ancestors were more than likely in a completely different activity level than active people today. That's the operative word here. We're mm. talking active people, athletes, right? So an Olympic athlete that is training hard and eating a lot, you can't say that they're a bad person because they're eating 500 grams of carbs when their training is literally demanding that and there is not necessarily much evolutional or historically accurate situation where they would really need that before. Because mm -hmm. again, I'm not an anthropologist. I don't know how much, I don't know if this is making sense, but from a level of, if I had to go out and hunt down a grizzly bear, that's a pretty acute like spike in energy demand. Like, sure. you know, once that bear is caught, I'm probably going back to being pretty sedentary. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. again, it would be interesting to start interviewing anthropologists on this because I think sometimes the nutrition community is taking it a little too far out of their lane to be having these discussions <laughs> right. when we don't know what the heck they're eating. But there's a reason why I bring this all back full circle, and that's just the fact that it's this energy flux again. It's like someone that is an Olympic athlete or someone that is a high-level CrossFitter, it's, it's okay for them to eat a lot and burn a lot. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the nutrition community makes it so cut and dry about deficit, 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 mm -hmm 
we get into these people just shrinking how much they're eating and they're slowly becoming inactive people <laughs> that just are wasting away right, and right. not preserving the most important thing that we could have, in my opinion, for muscle. sure. For sure. So. Yeah, that, that's, that's 100%, man. And when you think of the, the practical implications of high versus low energy flux, I mean, there, and the point of diminishing returns, right? What, like, where is that? I mean, people have careers as Olympic hopefuls for a block of time yeah. in their lives. Five years, 10 years, you know, right around there. And, and then you look at the different types of injuries in the different types of athletes. So strength and power athletes would tend to have more um, catastrophic uh, injuries at the, at the muscle level, whereas like competitive bodybuilders will have a bit more wear and tear at the, uh, the joints and the tendons. And then you have the regular weekend warrior, regular Joe, the guy who subscribes to men's health and like wants to look like the guy on the cover, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's trying to get there. He's maybe like a quarter of the way there. And where is that point that's actually healthy? Because he doesn't realize, what, what the men's health reader guide does not realize is that the guy on the cover of men's health has favorable genetics and he's fluxing really high. Usually, I mean, <laughs> so yeah, it, it's interesting to, to take these ideas and think of uh, how can we translate this to the regular person who's reading the magazines and kind of wanting that health and fitness level of frankly, somebody like yourself. <laughs> so that's really cool that you are kind of delivering it straight from the horse's mouth. I, I try to give people, I call them bricks in the wall, right? Because a lot of the things that I talk about if you were to look at them, each individual piece, it would be paralyzing, right? There's a lot of stuff that I put out there and like, oh, Thomas, one day you're talking about, you know, carbs and another day you're talking about keto. Like, what the heck is it that you're actually doing? No, I'm giving tools that you can have in the toolbox. I, my personal mantra has always been like, you know, with education comes adherence. At least that's how I operate. I have a hard time. I always have. It's why I struggled in school. Like, it, I struggled in, literally struggled in PE class because I was fresh because my PE teacher was obese. And I'm like, I have a hard time listening to you. And that's how I've always been. Like, mm -hmm. I have a hard time respecting or listening to someone that doesn't walk the walk. Sure. And so I've always wanted, to, okay, I want to learn for myself. And mm -hmm. you know what? I'm going to do it myself and I'll figure it out. So I try to apply that, right? I try to like, these are little bricks that you have in the wall. And if you watch 20 of my videos and you take away one thing that sticks, and that is the impetus for you to make a positive change, then hell yeah, we've got to win, right? Mm -hmm. And you may agree with disagree with 19 of the other things that I say, but one thing stuck with you and you may hate me by the end of these 20 videos, but you watched one thing that changed your life. Mm -hmm. My job's done. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it's been, any, I mean, so with that, uh, speaking of the person that's looking at men's health and stuff like mm. that, a lot of times they're looking at supplementation too. Let's, let's talk about this as one of the pillars of fat okay. loss, because okay. I think it's important. I think yeah, obviously a big industry. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there any supplements that you would consider important for fat loss? Okay, so the first one that comes to my mind, and this would have an indirect effect on fat loss, and that would be protein powder. Um, if there was like a, a, somebody asked me like, what, what diet hack is out there? What, what diet hack would you say? Yeah, like what food? And I'm thinking, uh, protein powder. <laughs> because it combines the um, nutrition, the convenience, and in some cases the, the you know the economicalness <laughs> of meeting a crucial uh, pillar of fat loss and, and health, frankly, is just getting your protein needs in. And so a lot of people, as they go through the life cycle, as they get older and whatnot, and they can't chew very well and everything, and you know. It's either protein powder or eggs, whole eggs. <laughs> um, eggs, are so, eggs are bad now, by the way. I know, I know, eggs, <laughs> eggs are bad. I've been having four eggs a day on average for the last 10, 15 years, so I've got the paramedics on standby. Yeah. I'm ready, man. I've I, got total cholesterol of like 172, and I've been having four to eight eggs pretty much every day every for the day. last 12 years. <laughs> We're, we're done, bro. Yeah, we're we're, done. We are done. So, yeah. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this might be the last time you see us. So, really want to thank you all for. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so fat loss supplements. 
I would say protein powder is up there for the reasons I stated. And honestly, I mean, the, the data on caffeine is solid. The data on green tea catechins is solid. Uh, coffee and co coffee is a staple in, in my diet. I, I think it's a good bonus that caffeine and, and fat loss has kind of done well in, in the literature. And also green tea has done fairly well. Um, I've, I'm on this matcha kick where I, man, I, I make shakes out of it. I, I just, I just dump it in, in shit. It's just, you know, I've always liked green tea ice cream and I'm like, you know, why not make, why not make protein shakes out of this damn thing, you know? And so, um, yeah, that's as far as I would go uh, with respect to supplementation and fat loss. It does kind of boil down to caffeine. I, I, I'm not a huge fan of popping no-dose pills. Yeah. I, I would almost encourage people to go for the win-win of either drinking tea or drinking coffee. And I know there's some controversy around coffee and health, but I think on balance, it's a net health positive, as long as you're not drinking two pots a day, <laughs> yeah. like some people end up doing. And as long as you can kind of manage your, your total caffeine intake by the end of the day and you're aware of that. Um, as far as adults go, the, the statistical average upper health, healthy limit for caffeine is, they're kind of boiling it down to 400 milligrams a day. However, this is an average. You know, there's some people who will do just fine on 600 and some people who will, will you know, 300 will be kind of putting them up over what they can handle in terms of maintaining good sleeping cycles. So yeah. you got to individualize that too. And uh, yeah, those are, those are the first things that would jump out at me as far as supplementation and fat loss. I mean, I guess we get the added benefit. I'm a huge matcha guy and green tea guy myself. I mean, that's like my jam. I mean, you get, for people like myself, I get a little bit wired up with coffee. So, I mean, you get the theanine, you get some of the other effects with, with green tea that at least make it so that, and also just the caffeine concentration isn't quite as high. So, I mean, I don't get as strung out on it as I, as I would otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, if people just take straight up EGCG, you know, straight up, straight up catechins, mm -hmm. there's, is there some fat loss benefit there or does it seem like based on the research it has to be in tandem with the caffeine? It, most of the research it's in tandem with the caffeine. Yeah. There might be some special stuff going on with those catechins, but um, it's usually in tandem with caffeine and it usually, there usually has to be some sort of CNS stimulation going on yeah. for that thermogenesis to occur and, and to a meaningful enough degree. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, that's generally my intro workout drink is green tea. I just sip on that. You know, pretty I just, dope. It's pretty awesome. But um, okay. Then we bring it into, let's kind of like give one pillar that's maybe geared towards more exercise, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I've always been a proponent of cardio personally, whether it's fasted or not. Yeah. Like I'm a big cardio guy. I know right now there's interesting movements out there. I've probably seen them floating around where people are, it blows my mind how much weird demonization of cardio there is out there right now. Sure. Um, what is your stance on cardio from a fat loss perspective? Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. It depends on the individual's level of non-exercise activity. So across the spectrum of, of individuals, regular working stiffs, <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna get folks who are, like for example, servers at a restaurant. And even people at, you know, at the cash register at Costco, boom, boom, yeah. you know. Uh, people stocking shelves at like, you know, Foot Locker. Any, anybody with a job that involves just physicality throughout the majority of the shift, any non-desk worker, their non-exercise activity is going to be significant. It's going to be, uh, especially if they're working an appreciable amount of, like let's say full-time or, or close to it. Those folks just kind of by default they are maintaining a level of physical activity that meets and exceeds like the standard guidelines for what is considered to maintain health and, and even optimize it. So with that, with those populations, they don't necessarily need to add formal cardio on top of what they're doing. 
unless they use that formal cardio as a hobby or a sport or just to kind of get out of their head as they you know navigate life they want to take a moonlit walk on the beach or at the park or around the neighborhood it's fine uh, but those people don't necessarily need cardio now you take somebody who works at a desk all day and then comes home and what they've got is Netflix and not necessarily the, the basketball court, you know, at the park or whatever, then that individual may want to consider forcing some formal cardio into their lives, getting something, uh, getting into some physical activity they enjoy, or even if it's just what a lot of people are doing now is just kind of getting on a, on a treadmill while they're watching, you know, Netflix, for example. So yeah, I think it really depends on the individual's level of non-exercise activity. And I, I like to bring my wife up in this conversation because from the moment she gets up to the moment she goes to bed, she doesn't sit down and she doesn't stop moving. So she literally, I mean, she just, she cooks two amazing meals a day, like every day. And she, she cleans up, she manages the house. And as I say this, I am slowly incriminating myself as a lazy <laughs> bastard. But, um, she doesn't need to do cardio. Uh, she's moving all day. And I would have to say that you really have to assess these kind of things on, on an individual basis. If somebody has specific endurance goals for a specific endurance, endurance sport or just recreational activity, by all means do the cardio. But um, not everybody needs to do it. And, and I, see, I see this thing with the fitness industry now, they're kind of sort of get swinging the pendulum back like there was this cardio backlash um maybe 10 years ago where people were like screw cardio man i'll just freaking do more reps you know and this you know whatever and, and um now it's like everybody's got to do cardio we got to keep our hearts healthy if you don't do cardio ooh, no you're just gonna die no, that's not true either you know yeah. yeah i think that where things get very discombobulated is there's correlational data with VO2 max and longevity and all these things. But people sometimes put the cart before the horse too. Fitness community aside, because fitness community is, uh, as you know, it's such a small cohort really. Like when you look at the big population, you're gonna do, you're gonna be better off for longevity just getting the weight off mm -hmm. than you are having an isolated period of cardio to improve your VO2 max to improve your longevity. Sure. Which again, I'm all for cardio and I'm all for doing cardio for cardiovascular benefit and for potential just, again, that decrease in all-cause mortality that is shown with increases in VO2 max. But that doesn't mean there's a very strong argument that if you just were to lose 30 pounds, that would be an even stronger reduction in all-cause mortality. Dude, so, absolutely. There's, there's levels of magnitude to, to the, the effects of these different lifestyle factors, right? So. When you look at the longest living populations in the world, you think of, well, the blue zones, you know, and when you think of the blue zones, you automatically think of the, the Okinawans. Mm -hmm. And the cardio that they're doing is like no intensity cardio. <laughs> they're either gardening or they're walking or they're getting on a bike and going to the freaking market. Yep. They're biking back. They're not like uh, spending all day hunting down game. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, but they're just lean and they're uh, psychosocially healthy as well. Yeah. So, you know, that, that combination of a certain amount of physical activity and strong family, friend ties, um, yeah. And of course diet has, has some influence in there, but I, I think that we can get the Okinawans more, more jacked and more functional. Yeah. I think we can add a little bit of muscle to them. Maybe they'll live to 150, you know yeah. what I mean? No, it's, uh, I've done a lot of content surrounding trying to identify common denominators of the blue zones because when we look at the blue zones and we look what's out there in the mainstream, mm -hmm. it's, it's sort of it's misleading because the common denominators, as you and I probably both know, is like social and they're active and you know, healthy relationships. Those are the solid common denominators that really are. Because each of the blue zones has very different styles of eating they really yeah. do there are a few common denominators but you know when you look at protein quantities like they vary widely too when you look at fructose quantities like you know costa rica obviously much more fructose intake than okinawans and mm -hmm. much different mm -hmm. than sardinia 
And so it's so wild to look at that. And I did a video a while back and actually performed very well where I was like trying to identify, instead of looking at these common denominators, let's look at the strong suits of each blue zone and try to combine cool. what That's the really best cool. longevity diet would be. And you know what it ended up coming down to? It ended up coming down to like a, a decent amount of like polyphenols and stuff from, from fruit and vegetables, it, a good amount of fiber, like, mm -hmm. you know, and like purple sweet potatoes and things like that, like the Okinawans, that's a huge staple, obviously fermented soy, which people did not want to hear, but that is, <laughs> there's very pretty decent data on that being good for them. Yeah. Uh, and it's different from, I mean, not all soy is the same, but anyway, I guess my point in saying this is that, you know, protein was also this piece that was higher in certain regions that had longer life expectancies. And so it's like, rather than saying, oh, let's try to find this common denominator mm -hmm. and say that this low meat, almost plant-based angle is the way to go. No, that actually isn't it when you look at what is working in each respective region. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also think that we're starting to find that the blue zones aren't exactly the gold standard anymore either. Like, sure. so. Um, it's very, very interesting. Obviously, we can go down a different rabbit hole with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've covered these five pillars, but there's one that we just kind of touched on briefly that I want to end on. And I'm all about strategically being able to use food as a reward responsibly without creating a binge-like mentality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I still think that as humans, from a dopaminergic standpoint, food is reward and we're biologically sort of ingrained to just work towards food. So I don't think that it's a problem to occasionally set like, hey, I'm gonna enjoy this meal or I'm gonna work towards this meal as long as it's not put on this pedestal of like, mm -hmm. this is your life, you know? Yeah. Like I'm not, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not gonna enjoy my life at all because I get to have a Twinkie on Saturday. <laughs> uh, but what can people do? Like how should they go about a cheat meal? How should they go about sort of indulging now and then without A, messing up their, their psyche, yeah. B, yeah. causing damage. Yeah, this is, this is kind of the messy answer that doesn't have a nice like bow tie to it or a nice universal two sentences that you can apply to everybody. But some people genuinely do better without a junk food allotment. You know, some people are comfortable just kind of avoiding anything that resembles a dessert, you know? Um, and honestly, that's fine. That's fine for those individuals. But the majority of the population, if they're presented with the idea that it's okay to have this stuff, but just keep it at a low roar, then it almost removes the, uh, the psychological um, power that those foods have over the individual. And so like with people with binge eating disorder, they obviously have some dopaminergic dysregulation and they, they get a much stronger response, a much stronger reward response from certain foods than people who don't have binge eating disorder. But they also, as a group, have, they're, they're sort of miseducated on the idea that certain foods are to be avoided completely no matter what. Like they've got this dichotomous view of foods, like these are the good foods that will contribute to my health and these are the only foods that I'm allowed to have. And these foods, ah, these foods will kill me. Yeah, you know, either slowly or quickly, and I've got to avoid them at all costs. When the reality of the matter is, I mean, even like tying the, the blue zones back in, right? Even though the blue zones are an observational thing, and Dan Buettner probably, for all we know, just enjoyed visiting this. <laughs> He just enjoyed visiting those five spots and there's like 10 other places we need to report on, right? But even the blue zones, they have their indulgence allotments, whether it be their own versions of desserts or whether it be their, <laughs> their home brewed alcoholic beverages um, and just ver various indulgence type foods. If people can keep them at a low roar, which admittedly, subjectively, 10 to 20 percent ish of total of your total caloric intake uh, you can still have a, an overall healthy diet that's 80 to 90 percent you know wholesome and so if people can kind of embrace that idea that the, the diet as a whole can still be healthy even if you have certain foods that are stereotypical junk then you still are increasing your chances of living um, as long and as as vigorously as the person who goes like hundred percent in quotes, clean and 0% junk. So, um, and the data behind that 
is pretty interesting and, and pretty consistent too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you see these, I mean, I notice with myself, if I go very, very clean, it's sort of this law of attrition where, you know, then it's like a, a little snack of a piece of junk here and there, and then a couple of little snacks of a piece of junk. But you never really log it figuratively in your brain because it's just like, uh, if it's, if it's, you know, if you're snacking out of the pantry, it's free food, it doesn't count, right? <laughs> and eventually you realize that like you're actually doing more collective damage over the course, like when you count that grazing. And so I'm one of these people that need to, I, I, I like having a defined period where I can just let my hair down a little bit mm. and left to my own devices. I don't usually go totally ham. Like I'll usually just, maybe I'll go have some gluten-free pizza or something and have a couple slices and call it a day. And, mm. and then I feel, feel, feel good. And I want to end it with something that's very important again, because it's such a big intermittent fasting audience, right? With fasting, it can be, and I caution people because it can because it become a very slippery slope, uh, a very much so a binge and purge type, like binge and then fast, binge and then fast. Mm. And sometimes intermittent fasting becomes a license for people to do that and to live that lifestyle, which is probably detrimental in, in many ways. You're going with uh, you know, extended periods without food and then you're having a smorgasbord of not so good food, probably having a you know, series of inflammatory cascades that come from just having junk you know, and never giving yourself optimal eating periods to get adequate nutrition and micronutrients in, right? You're just eating, you know, Pop-Tarts and lasagna or something. It's not going to work. <laughs> that sounds kind of good. But <laughs> <laughs> the, the caution, like, it's okay to occasionally use intermittent fasting as a tool to be able to enjoy a cheat meal. Yeah. The one recommendation that I have that has worked well for me is to have the fasting occur after the cheat meal versus leading up to it because I feel like it instills this insane reward mm. of fasting yeah. that is almost you know, bass backwards from what we should be doing. It's like, if you're gonna enjoy this cheat meal, then you'll probably be satiated enough the next day to probably fast anyway, mm -hmm. and you'll probably feel better about the situation. I find that when people do a fast and then just indulge and go crazy, it just solidifies this like, okay, the fasting was good and this was the reward. I'm just gonna to continue to starve myself and, and I've seen that time and time and time again. Yeah. And that's, there's no data to back that up other than my experience, you know, anecdotal experience in working with people. Um, yeah, but it, it's a slippery slope, you know. Um, there's, a, there's a decent body of research showing that uh, the, sort of the regular consumption of certain foods um, or, or rather the avoidance of certain foods, a certain junk type of high reward foods, it kind of deadens the craving for it over time. And my issue with that is, well, when you look at weight regain, it's usually via these kind of foods that people were avoiding that whole time. And so there's al it's almost like a setup for backlash for the majority of folks. So. If you do like certain junk type of foods, I think that there's always a healthy -er version of it. Um, I just, I mean, just using myself, for example, I love chocolate. I mean, I love anything remotely chocolatey, you know? Uh, so I, <laughs> okay, so I know, I know that their chocolate gate just happened with uh, <laughs> with the heavy metals and then all that stuff. So now I'm like a little bit tiptoeing around that. But in any case, I have chocolate almost every day, but it's in these pre-broken little chunks, those, those Trader Joe's um, yeah. uh, pound plus, the 72% cocoa things. And, and to my taste, that that's some of the best tasting chocolate like ever. I mean, I've had it all and that's that's my favorite. And I love peanut butter. And so, Seriously, like knowing that I can have that every day as long as I don't eat the whole jar and I don't eat the whole like pound of chocolate, I'm totally good. And, uh, and I, I, I rarely exceed two squares of those chocolates in a day and I rarely exceed two, you know, rounded teaspoonfuls of peanut butter in a given day. And what I'll, what I'll do is um, just if I'm craving the chocolate, I'll, I'll have a square of that and a handful of almonds and it's honestly as good as any damn chocolate bar out there. And um, a late night snack that I've been getting into, which you, you might appreciate, because <laughs> I, I love Greek yogurt. So um, I, I take Greek yogurt, about you know two thirds of a cup of it, and then a teaspoon of uh, peanut butter, 
and then I just dump like, I don't know, uh, an illegal amount of honey on top of it. And I call it Broden Force. Instead of Odin Force, it just looks like this amber glow of the honey just drowning this freaking thing. And I'm like, yeah, it's, it's Broden Force. <laughs> so, like, it's a, late, it's a late night snack of mine. And uh, the thing is, I'm aware of how it contributes to my entire day's intake. And I mean, it, it fits right in. It, it's an elegant and, and yummy snack. And I think that people, when, when they have this idea that junk food's gotta be super junky, like a freaking Pop-Tart or a Ho-Ho or a freaking Twinkie, it doesn't have to be. There's extremely delicious, desserty stuff that actually contributes decent nutrition to your day without wrecking the whole diet. And I think in a lot of cases, it's just kind of knowing what these things are. Yeah. Broden Force, for example. Yeah. No, I do a similar thing with Greek Let's hear it. Yep. Greek, Greek yogurt. Fess up, baby. Yeah, no, Let's no, go. No, it's Greek, yeah, Greek yogurt. I'll use the Lakanto monk fruit drops. So I'll get like unsweetened, put some Lakanto monk fruit drops in there, and then I'll put uh, usually like a, a scoop of like unflavored, unsweetened whey protein in there, just that. And then I'll put a little bit of cocoa powder. And then if I'm feeling frisky, I'll put some blueberries or something. And then I use those uh, Chalk Zero chocolate chips. So those are like, you know, sugar-free chocolate chips and put those in. And that's, I mean, honestly, if I'm using the 0% Greek yogurt, we're not talking that many calories mm -hmm. anyway. We're talking very minimal carbohydrates. I don't feel guilty about it. Again, I'm aware of the calories in it. Sure. Point is, it's something I look forward to and it actually keeps me on the rails. Like it, 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 you have to have these little vices depending on how you are. But mm -hmm. anyway, man, where can everyone find you? AlanAragon.com. Uh, my biggest platform is probably Instagram. Yeah. Facebook is just dying for some reason, man. Well, it's just Facebook. I don't know what happened, yeah. but it's just, uh, yeah. But yeah, AlanAragon.com is where you can find my stuff. And uh, I just want to thank you so much for having me out here for Anybody who doesn't know, Thomas has just the most amazing gym setup over here. It's better than a lot of commercial gyms, and it's his own personal thing. So, super impressed, man. Just Appreciate to, it, man. like the whole the whole thing is amazing. Cool. So yeah, awesome. But. Yep. As always, keep it locked to hear my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.